Did you feel that? What? Those words are right out of the scripture. I can't remember which psalm that was taken from, but wow. Man, I feel like you could eat demons for breakfast, you know? Just, we've been so set up. God's plan has always been for us to be above. He said, I'll make you the head and not the tail. I'll make you the top and not the bottom. You're going to be the lender and not the borrower. Wow. So how many of you know that with God, one can send a thousand to flight? And two, how many? Ten thousand. Ah. Okay, don't do it without God. You know, it's just the Holy Spirit will just keep revealing to you the different ways that we keep trying to go without God, you know, depending on our own strength. But if you just switch gears, just hit the Holy Spirit button on you and say, okay, I'm not by might or by power, but by his spirit, hit that button. And as soon as you're with the Holy Spirit, everything changes. The power of God takes over. And, uh, and then all of a sudden you, you got the horse in front of the cart again. Uh, I used to do it the other way for a long time. Got really tired, very depressed, angry, frustrated. It wasn't fun to be around. But now I'm really fun to be around. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. Family life. There's so much power in family. There's power in unity. There's power in togetherness. In America, in our Western culture, we have learned to think very individualistically. We see ourselves at the center of the universe. If you go to Eastern cultures, they don't see life that way. Everything is very interconnected there. They see themselves more as part of a whole, which is really more accurate to biblical thinking, to Hebraic thinking. It was more in line with the way the Israelites received an understanding of life from God. And um, so we often have disconnects in our life because our first orientation in our thinking is, is me sitting in the center, uh, being powerful, and then everything kind of flows out for me. And then I just kind of add God into the picture. But it's still about me. And so because of that, our tendency is to uh, go it alone. I can take care of me. I'm going to be powerful. I'm going to show you who I am. I'm going to prove to you that I can do it. My self-esteem is, is, is built up with my own personal accomplishment and success. And whether you're a part of it or not, I really don't care. In fact, it's better if it's just me without you, because then I look more important. But we have a different picture in the scripture that it took just one man's sin, a man named Achan, who brought down an entire nation into defeat. And God judged all of Israel as they moved from the success of Jericho, the victory of Jericho, to the slaughter of the next city, Ai. One man's choice. Because in the kingdom of God, God sees everything corporately together. God has never chosen for us to live apart from one another. No man is an island. Western thinking has, has, has tried to create, and a lot of it is just rooted in, in pride. It's one of the ways that we've learned to um, how to move forward so nobody's in my way. And some of it is even uh, a, a little form of rebellion. No one's going to tell me what to do. So it may seem convenient to us at one point to be individual, uh, independent, but God created us to find strength in interdependence. Now, how many think that you're going to get very far independent of God? Yeah. 
And God has actually chosen not to be independent of us. He's actually chosen to rule and reign over this planet through us. He could do it himself, and he'd do it very well. And he'd save himself a lot of headaches because we just keep messing things up. But God has not changed his mind. You see, in the heavens, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit operate together. Three in one. And each one of them are pointing to the other as a source of blessing. Each one is honoring the other. They've chosen to be one. And that the glory of the Lord, the purposes of God, would be released through the three instead of the one. The Father could have created the world, but he said, Son, I've got ideas and plans, but I want you to do it. The Son, the Scripture tells us the Son... Through him, all things were created. But we see, as you go back into the book of Genesis, there's a third party. See, it was the Holy Spirit hovering over the face of the deep. And we don't know how all that worked. Maybe we'll know better when when we get into uh, heavenly places. God may show us how he worked it all out. But there is a unity in heaven that we don't understand. And in that unity is a greater degree of glory and power and wisdom that Satan does not want us to access. Because if we would ever access it, it would take us to a higher level of grace flowing through the church to touch the world and redeem it. Satan's not too worried about a bunch of churches being everywhere as long as he can divide them all. So Satan said, hey, I got an idea for you. Let's call it denominations. Which if you break down the etymology of those words means divided nations. And Jesus said a kingdom divided against itself cannot what? Stand. Are we as a church across the world weakened greatly because we have chosen to operate independently in our pride? I'm better than you. In fact, I happen to know that we're the only ones going to heaven. Your theology and your doctrines and your way of doing things, and that's not God. He won't bless that, but he does bless us because we have the truth. And we certainly don't need you. Does that make God's heart sick? Does it make it heart sick when it happens within a church? When with, where, where there is no family, there is no corporate mindset, there is no sense of interdependence and I need you and I value you and you... I, you know, we, we honor one another and we build up one another and we strengthen one another and we believe one another and we prophesy over one another. We call the best out of one another. We cover each other's sins. We lift one another up. We carry each other's burdens. You know all the verses I'm hitting on. If you know the scriptures, I'm just, I'm hitting on all these cylinders that God has put in the engine of the church to make us strong and move us ahead. Wow. So all Satan has to do is say, well, I'll let the church exist. I'll just come into the midst with different kinds of spirits, political spirits, divisive spirits. Spirits of control. Spirits of judgment. I just help the people to forget that they were birthed in mercy, the mercy that triumphs over judgment. And I'll just help pull that mercy out of the middle of that church so they won't know how to treat one another in mercy and grace. And the only thing that's left is judgment and pride. And then I'll build up a spirit of mistrust in their midst and where they are afraid of one another because they say, oh, you, you could hurt me. 
because of what you know about me. I can't afford to reveal my weakness. I can't afford to reveal that I have any needs because you might judge me. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to put on my plastic face, my plastic Jesus face, and, uh, and everything's just fine with me. What's wrong with you? And if only you were as good as I was. No, I don't need prayer. But you do. In fact, I've got the anointing for you. In fact, God showed me something about you. Would you like to know how powerful I am and what I know about you? You need me, but I don't need you. What does that create? More unsettled division, more mistrust. It's not a safe place. Satan doesn't mind if there's a church here as long as the prodigals are afraid to come home. Because the spirit of the elder brother is there ready to pounce and to judge and to control. And, and it's eventually, the love grows cold. Eventually, we're just, we exist to prove that we exist. And the kingdom of God is stifled. The spirit of God can't move. The love of the Father can't heal the, the orphan, broken hearts. So I've watched this for decades now. I've lived long enough in the church. Just to see the, some good, a lot of bad, and a lot of ugly. Come to the conclusion that the Father's love and the Father's family is the only answer. And that if we became the most powerful, tight-knit, loving family, we would go some places that we've never been before with God. We'd experience levels of his spirit moving in our midst. And I've come to the conclusion, you can have all the revival you want, but if you don't end up with family, you didn't end up with heaven. You might have got a bunch of people, quote, saved. But you just birthed them into an orphanage. And they never really find the father. One of my prayers has been, Lord, I don't want you to move powerfully in our midst. I don't want you to, to suddenly open up the gates of heaven and have a whole bunch of newborn babies come into our midst just to have them get wrecked. So any, any mother who is with child knows that instinct of I've got to get a place ready for my child. They want an environment for their baby where that baby is going to experience life and protection and, and uh, good stuff. It's very important. It's important in the church too. We need life life-giving environment. We need one another. Now, in, in, throughout church history, as theologians and church leaders have, have tried to grapple with the teachings of the scripture and what is God's best, what causes the church, the people of God, the, the ecclesia is the Greek word, that the called out ones of God who have been, who've been called out from a corrupt world into the kingdom, out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of life. What causes life to happen? Well, we know this one thing. Grace causes life to happen. Grace is the empowerment, the empowering favor of God over your life where the life of Jesus himself is flowing to you, through you, to others. And everywhere you are, life happens. And so they asked the question of, well, if we need more grace, and you look at Paul's letters, 
in almost every one of his letters start off with this. Grace and peace be unto you. What is he suggesting? He's suggesting that you don't have as much grace as you need. You need more grace. You need more of God's grace to you. You say, well, I'm already under grace. Well, yeah, you are. But grace is not just something that you take for granted. Grace is something that you operate in that's been made available. And so you have to ask yourself the question, as the early church fathers did, what are the means of grace that allow the empowering life of Jesus to flow through us that we become all that we are supposed to be not just individually, but corporately. Again, remember, God's plan to save the world is not you. It's us. Us across the whole world. Us everywhere the name of Jesus connects us together. That's God's plan to save the world. How do we get more grace? And as the early church fathers were going through the scriptures and going through their own experiences as, as the church. They said that, well, we know it's very clear baptism is a way that God releases more grace into our lives. C taking communion together, the Lord's table, we've commanded to be, you know, to pursue baptism, to pursue communion. But they said, are, are there more things? Well, teaching. Receiving the teaching of God's word will release more of the grace of God to you. The laying on of hands, that will release more of God's grace to you, the impartation. They came up with quite a list, but one of the things they came up with, um, that they said this is absolutely necessary, is the fellowship of the saints. The fellowship of the saints. By the way, you don't do that by Facebook very well. See, what our nation is craving and needing so badly right now is we're getting more and more divided. Is we're needing relationship. Vital, life-giving relationship. And so Satan said, I've got a plan. I'll create a massive distraction that will allow everybody to stay individually hidden in their pretend world and they'll relate to one another through a medium that allows them to feel like they're alive and important but they stay separated because they never connect just words and and I never really am known for who I am nor do I really get to know you there's a little bit that happens on Facebook I don't, I'm not throwing the whole thing away. But it's, as far as I'm concerned, most everything that's happening relationally through the Internet is just killing us. It's starving us. Now, that's my personal opinion. I can't back that up with the Scripture. It's just, it's just what I'm watching happen. Do I use the Internet? Yep. Do I relate to people through the Internet? Yep. If it's the only way I can. But... I've had more relational blow-ups over the Internet than I can think of in terms of blessing. You ever have an email go wrong on you? <laughs> ever post something that you went, oops? Somebody responds to, you, <laughs> to your post particularly. Some of you is, are blissfully happy that you don't have any connection to the Internet at all right now. I'm not sure that you're missing anything. I want you to turn with me to Acts chapter 2. I'm, I'm going to just start today. I may continue next week, but I'm just going to touch on a couple things. How do we access the means of grace through the fellowship of the saints? God established this thing called the fellowship of the saints. It was always God's plan for his people to be in a family in interdependent relationships with one another where they would draw strength from each other. Life would flow through loving relationships. And by the way, I am fully aware that many of you have been beaten up 
in fellowship, in the church. I've got some of my own scars. In fact, I got some big scars. I've never been more deeply hurt than I have by Christians and by the church. And, and you know, it's just like if you get hurt in childhood, we oftentimes make decisions like, I'm never going to trust again. I'm never going to get close again. I'm never going to put myself in that situation again where somebody can hurt me. You can't get hurt except in relationships, right? That's where most of our pain in life comes from is in relationships. And so when you start talking about relationships and getting close and people coming together, it's like, ah, don't do that to me. You see, I've made some inner vows about what I'm never going to let happen to me again. But you've got to be careful because Satan is a deceiver. And oftentimes he sets you up for the pain so that you make a choice that will cut you off from the very means of grace that God has for you through relationships. God's plan is for you to greatly benefit in your relationship with him. And I, I talked to many, many people struggling in their relationship with God because they've made choices about all relationships in general. And God is relational, and so he's part of that package. I wonder if in heaven we're going to have relationships. Are you ever going to know anybody or be close to anybody or have to relate to anybody? So, well, in heaven we'll be safe because nobody's going to sin. Well, I hope that's true. But here's the deal. God never intended for you to wait to get to heaven to experience kingdom relationships. He calls us saints now so that we could experience the life of Jesus flowing through us now. So if you're waiting, you know, if, if you're trying, if your goal is to be safe in this lifetime, you will find yourself with huge chunks of your destiny missing because your destiny depends on relationships. You're only four people away from any person on the planet, all seven billion. They've done the studies. You're only one person away from your next breakthrough. Many of our breakthroughs never happen because we've chosen to cut ourselves off from relationships and never get put ourselves in that position where someone might be able to do something to me. And because I've chosen to cut myself off in order to make myself safe, God can't release to me as much as he wants to what he has available for me because he's chosen to release it to me through another person. I believe that there's a lot of healing that people don't receive in their body because they never are willing to ask for prayer. I'm one of those people. I just, I'd rather just pray about it myself. I don't want to have to bother with having you put your hands on me and try to grapple with my issues. I don't want to have to be vulnerable and humble myself and say, would you pray for me? I just want to claim the promises and go to God and get my healing and boom, it's all done. Sounds pretty powerful. But James 5 says, is anyone sick among you? Let him fast and pray. Lock themselves away in a closet and an angel will show up and set you free. What does it say? Let them call. Oh, that involves people. Oh, shoot. <laughs> oh, Lord. I, I don't have to go through that. Anybody relating to what I'm saying? I'm just I'm telling you what I've what I wrestle with. We got to get over this stuff. We got to get over our fears. 
we got to get over. You know, and if you, if you will let the Holy Spirit re- reveal to you, he will show you one um, choice after another that you have made in the past because of pain that you've had with other people, whether it be your parents, siblings, uh, whoever, where you have said, never again. And in that never again, you have cut off. You're, you're actually in agreement with the devil. You're in partnership with his plan for division and separation and independence so that you will try to live as an island unto yourself. You'll post your sign on your island saying, I'm a blessing, come here. But you never cross over to somebody else's island saying, I need help. You'd rather drown first. You'd rather starve first before I'm going to need somebody else. Acts chapter 2. Verse 41. So then those who received his word, Peter just finished preaching at Pentecost. Those who received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. Whoa, there's a relational mess right there. 3,000 people don't even know each other. All suddenly birthed into God's family by the Holy Spirit. God is up to something? Absolutely. Revival is happening. But in the midst of this revival, it means people with all their stuff. You see, they're brand new, birthed into the kingdom And they all got sin habits. They've all got religious stuff that they've been carrying around. I mean, they got saved out of this, the religious performance stuff of Judaism at that point. And and suddenly now, they all get baptized. They hear, they get baptized, 3,000 of them in one day. That's a lot of people to throw together. Okay, sounds scary to me. You might be one of those people who say, you know, I don't like crowds. You have to ask yourself why you don't. Is it because you might run into somebody you don't like? You might run into somebody who doesn't like you? You might run into somebody who's just like you. Okay. Okay. Boy, it's getting really hot in here. <laughs> and about 3,000 souls. And they were doing what? Did they all just go home and say, well, that's good. Got my ticket punched for heaven. Now I'll just wait for Jesus to come back. No, see, grace came upon them all. And something spontaneous happened by the Holy Spirit that caused this first movement of revival to begin to shake the city of Jerusalem and ultimately lead to a revival that swept through the whole Roman Empire without an army, without weapons. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer and everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles and all those who had believed were together makes me nervous just thinking about it just they were all together And they had all things in common. Oh, (laughs) we had to share. (laughs) I got to let you have my stuff. I got to let you use my things. What if you don't do it the way I do it? What if you break something? (laughs) What if you take more than me? Oh, all of our childhood stuff comes out. 
How much, how much time do parents invest with their little kids, teaching them how to have all things in common? You always, you know, I was, I was just, we were just visiting our daughter last, last weekend with her three sons. They're six, four, and two. You know one of the number one words that I kept hearing in those few days that I was there? It's the word share. Share. You know what the number one cause for all the fights between those boys were? Give me my stuff. Don't touch my stuff. That's my puzzle. Ah. It's just Okay, common ground in one house. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. And day by day, continuing with one mind. Oh, that's a headache right there. To be of one mind. How hard is it to be of one mind? Well, with the Holy Spirit, it's pretty simple because there is only one mind if you yield yourself over to that mind. But if you're clinging to your own mind, oh, we got problems. We got arguments. We got disagreements. We got judgments. And I know what's wrong with you because you don't think like me. That's your problem. And if everybody thought the way I thought and see things the way I see, according to my experiences and my background and the way I've been taught and what feels comfortable to me and so forth, we'd all get along just fine. So you better change. Okay, I'm just telling you my own selfish way of going about in life so often. I'll be right in the middle of it and the Holy Spirit will say, Oh, it doesn't smell like me. Not thinking the way I think. They're of one mind. Breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. That means the non-believers. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. There have been a lot of books written just on this passage right here, trying to somehow duplicate what happened in the early church. There are others who say, well, that happened back then. It can't happen now. And we shouldn't try to duplicate that. I'm not calling for a duplication. I'm just calling for learning. I'm just saying, if it could happen back then, can it happen now? And if the results that they got are still available, I want them what do we need to do so that we have favor with all the people? You know, you know how much disfavor is coming upon the church in America right now? There's never been a time in the history of America where Christians are so despised and the church is, is wanting to be flushed down the toilet by people. A lot of it, I think most of it, we've brought upon ourselves. But I'd like to have the favor of all the people. I'd like to have God adding to our number daily, those who are being saved. I'd like for God to have something that he could look down and say, that's worth adding people to. I think God's pretty tired of religious clubs. You can join us if you agree with us. If you'll practice our practices. A lot of churches out there, you got to sign a piece of paper. You can be one of us if you agree to all of these doctrines. I think it makes God's heart very sad. Because it's just all wrapped up in our insecurity. You know, it's our biggest issue. Insecurity. And most of our insecurity has come in life because we've been hurt by other people. And so we think that the way that I won't 
get hurt and I'll be safe is if I can wall myself off in various ways. I can control my relationships with people. But I want to say to you that the way out of your insecurity is through relationship. It's a, it's a total deception to think I will be free from fear if I can control everything that's going on around me with other people. The problem is, is that if you have a wall between you and somebody else, you can't do this thing that Jesus called for. He said, a new commandment I give to you. This was as Jesus was giving his final words to the disciples before he was about to be crucified. He said, I have one thing that I give to you. And he's called it a command, a rule. And he knew this was the only way that everything that he had come to do and was going to die for and be resurrected for and then leave. There was only one way that all of, that he had accomplished on the cross when he said, it is finished, it's done. And he defeated the power of darkness and he opened up the way for us to have full relationship with God and have access to all that God has for us, to be in his family. There was only one way that that would succeed and go from person to person to person so that all that God had would just keep flowing without any break, regardless of what Satan would try to do. And it was all wrapped up in this one word, love. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you. I'm telling you, that's a command that the church has yet to fulfill. I'm working on it. It's one of my number one prayers right now. Lord, help me to love like you love. Help me to love. See, I, I don't even fully understand how he loves me, how he's loved me. So if I don't even know that, and I have a hard time even receiving his love from me, it's pretty hard for me to get it out to you or to anybody else out there. It's still easier for me to be angry, frustrated, reactive, divisive, judgmental. There's something instinctual in us because of our, our sinful flesh, that side of us that still wants to connect with the sin nature that we would rather move towards division and cutting off than to move towards overcoming evil with good, overcoming what people are dishing out to us with love, to reconcile, to still believe in another person even when they're behaving awful. I would rather say, you're behaving awful. I don't have to put up with you. I just write you off. You're not worth it. That's what my flesh would like to do. But the spirit of God in me, who hopes all things, believes all things, and endures all things, it's called love. The spirit of God in me says, his love never fails. It never gives up. <laughs> And so, I'm not allowed to end relationships. I'm not allowed to define how I'm going to be safe with you. I mean, there is such a thing as boundaries, with boundaries that come from wisdom. But you know what? I'm getting so tired of hearing people use the word boundaries as an excuse for why they don't have to love somebody else, an excuse for division. And there's certainly no room for boundaries in the church. We've been called to fellowship. Some people say fellowship is two fellows in the same ship. That's kind of an interesting, simple answer. It's much deeper than that. 
You're in the same ship because you've been called by a common father through a common savior and you have been birthed into his family by the same spirit. And the most important thing that there is in the universe is what marks both of you. You've been called by the same father. And he takes both of you and he brings you into his presence. And I said, I love you and I love you. I'd like for you to love each other. And if I can get the two of you to love each other and be of the same mind, the same purpose, Philippians 2, one mind, one spirit, one body, if I could get the two of you together to value one another, to appreciate each other, to see me in each of you, to see and identify why each of you was born and the destiny that you carry and the greatness that's on you. If I could get the two of you to connect, something powerful would explode out of that ship. And you'd be able to go somewhere. We've been called together. Called as one. Called. We got the same blood. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, blood is thicker than water. Well, we got, we got some thick blood in us. It's his blood now. Pulsing through our veins. They were devoted to fellowship. Fellowship is the deliberate choice I make to spend time with you because you have something of Jesus that I need. I may not know what it is, but it's worth finding out. Fellowship is me seeing one or more people that I am willing to invest myself time, energy, and resource into that person or persons on a continual basis so that the best that's in you rubs off on me. And through the mutual building up of one another and trusting one another and calling the best out of each other and praying for one another and encouraging one another, What God originally created us for just begins to start coming to the surface. The most powerful shifts that have come in my life have come through my committed relationships. People to whom I'm committed deeply and people who are deeply committed to me. There's a lot of surface relationships. There's a lot of what we call friendships or whatever, just acquaintances, you know. We still got our happy face on. But there's not just a sharing of good times. There's also the sharing of bad times. There's, there's when I let somebody see my struggle, when I, when I let somebody see my sin. James said something really crazy. He said, confess your sins one to another that you might be healed. Oh, God, don't let me join that church. Whew. When they do that, I'm, going, I'm at the back door now. John Wesley, who is considered one of the greatest revivalists a few hundred years ago, not only through England, but New England over here, who was the father of uh, just, it was wild what happened through that man. Everywhere he went, he preached, people were saved, and he would gather them together, Acts 2 groups, would gather them together, they say, you all need each other. You won't make it without each other. 
And they would gather together on a regular basis, at least once a week. And they would share. And they would sing. They would worship. There would be teaching. But one of the first things that they did before they did anything else is they would gather together and they would confess their sins one to another. Do you think that had any power? Definitely kept the devil from getting in there and deceiving people. and Because uh, hidden sin always eventually erodes our best intentions with God. John Wesley knew that. So he said, I'm going to have groups where they are so close to one another and they're so determined to walk with God in purity and maintain what they have that they would actually share their weaknesses and their sins. And you know what the response was when somebody would say, this week I disobeyed God and I did this. Was there judgment or was there prayer? See, they knew if, if I share my struggle with, with you in this group of committed relationships, even though we're all different, we have different strengths and weaknesses and so forth and different levels of walking with God, but if I share this hard side of me, you're going to believe in me. You're going to believe in the Christ that's in me. You're going to believe in God's plan for my life. You're going to believe that mercy still reigns. And you're going to pray for me because you know that you're just one decision away from doing the same thing I did. And there was such a support and a strength. And they walked in a level of power and purity that was unstoppable and swept through. It didn't sweep through the churches. It couldn't even happen in the churches. The churches completely rejected what was going on. But John Wesley just gathered all these people into these groups, and they were the church. They had all things in common. They blessed each other, supported each other, believed in each other, and it was each other, each other, each other, all the way through. And out of that group were raised up so many revivalists and pastors and preachers. And uh, they just, they were covering the countryside in every direction. And the institutional church sat back and said, whoa, wish we had those results. The fellowship of the saints. It brings out the best of us, brings out the worst of us, but it's us with Jesus. And his redemptive mercy flows between us where we just keep helping each other and keep believing each other, supporting each other, praying for one another, laying hands on one another, healing one another, delivering one another. be pretty cool to be in relationships with people where my blind spots are not an issue. Anybody in the room have blind spots? <laughs> Don't raise your hand. Because you're blind. The only reason we know we have blind spots is that you might have had an experience where you realized something about yourself that you didn't know. You got a revelation and you went, oops. And suddenly you thought, there might be more. <laughs> and most of our blind spots affect other people negatively. And that's why we just would rather not go there. But how many of you would just secretly, deep down inside, would just like all your blind spots to go away. I would. Well, I hate to tell you this. The answer, God's answer to blind spots 
is not you in your prayer closet or you with your Bible. It's you with other people. Who love you and care enough about you to handle what's going on with you with gentleness like Jesus would. <sighs> then the church gets stronger. The grace just increases and flows. And Some of you might be thinking, well, can you tell me where that church is and I'll go join it? But you know the old saying, as soon as you find a perfect church and join it, you just wrecked it. So here it, here it, I mean, this is it. This is what we have to work with. I have this idea that God put us together. Oh, no. Don't tell me. I, I want to be able to just go to church and then leave without any commitments, without any connections, without... Well, you can do that. we got lots of seats available for those people. It's just they don't usually go anywhere. And they usually don't get past their issues. They usually don't get healed all that much. They usually don't get set free from much in their lives and they just keep repeating the same stuff because they're independently blissfully ignorant it takes being thrown together with other saints that are getting over their stuff and we struggle together love doesn't come automatically we learn to love and you don't know that you're really loving until you're with somebody else that's challenging. Or you're making choices to see them the way God sees them and treat them the way God treats them. Believing something. <coughs> and standing in commitment. That's what I'm hoping for here. That's family. And uh, Margie and I are trying to be mom and dad <clears throat> in this whole thing, and we're not perfect parents. So we got a big dysfunctional family here. Our only hope is Jesus, the Spirit of God. And a faith that says there's more, so we can't stop. We got to keep going. We got to keep trying. We got to keep working at this. We got to just keep pulling people together. Keep humbling ourselves. Keep admitting our need for one another. Keep confessing our sins, our stuff. Keep praying for each other. Ultimately, anything that God's going to do through this church is going to happen through committed people who are not just committed to him, but we're committed to one another, and we just don't stop. And we don't let anything divide us, and we don't run. The first sign that somebody looks like Somebody that hurt you in the past, whether it be me that reminds you of the father that you had that hurt you. Well, that happens a lot. I've lived with that for years and years. You know, we, got to, we have to start making some new choices about where we're going to get life and more grace. And I'm just telling you, based on the word, it's through this. It's not through coming in and looking at the back of somebody else's head and having your individual seat and your individual experience with God and then we go, oh, that was good, okay, I'm part of that church and then you leave. It's through all these other connections where we sit face to face 
listening, hearing, valuing, maybe disagreeing, but we're not controlling, we're not manipulating, we're not judging. We're trying to find something together. And it's hard work. Anybody real, you know, found relationships are hard work? You know, you get married because you fell in love. And it's a good thing you made some vows. Because otherwise, there's no way. So how long does it take to fall out of love? How long does it take before the honeymoon is over? Well, it's true in the church. People come into a church and they go, oh, okay, this place feels kind of safe. I, they, hey, they're, they're kind of doing what I like to do. I'm feeling kind of comfortable here. I, they, they've got some of the stuff I think I'm looking for and some of the needs that I have I think can get met here. And, and you know, we, we just kind of come in and we, we try something on and, and we've got one foot out the back door just in case. And some people are at a church for 10 years with their foot out the back door. And they'll serve and they'll pray and they'll give and they'll do all the rest but somewhere there's just my safety is that foot out, just slightly out the back door because if that thing ever happens that I'm afraid I'm, I'm out of here so how strong is that all that does is make you the weakest link sorry I said that but it's true What I'm afraid of is me being the weakest link because of my level of commitment and relationship. Sometimes the pastor is the weakest link in the church. Okay, I better relieve you. Uh, <laughs> so what am I saying in all this? Let's have relationship. Let's have fellowship. Let's determine in this next year that we're going to go after grace that can only come one way. You can get baptized by yourself. You can take communion by yourself. You can get hands laid on you by yourself. There's all kinds of things that you can do by yourself. But it's the stuff that flows through the one another, one another, one another, where you've got to have connection with people. There's no shortcuts to that. But you make the choice. Nobody can make you do it. There's a lot of ways to connect in our church. I wish there were more. We're working on it. So we got a list of lots of different relational ways to connect with people and various, doing various things on that back table. I hope you pick one up and make a quality decision for fellowship. It's really just a decision for more of God's grace in your life. It's a decision to break through into your destiny at a higher level. It's a decision to let God do something with us that's greater than what he can do through just you. Okay. See, this when you say, thank you, Pastor Paul. Thank you. You so liberated me here today. I feel so free right now. Even be just, just because my anxiety level went way, way up. <laughs> you just dialed up my worst fears. But I'm excited. I've got faith for something new in my life that's going to happen through other people in this church. Or you decided you're going to find another church <laughs> where you don't have to have relationship. There's a lot of those around. They'll let you do it. I'm just not going to. I'm going to keep the pressure on just because I know what we need. Okay, let's stand. Can you take the hand of the person next to you? Oh, do I have to touch somebody here?
Just say with me. I am the body of Christ. Not by myself, but with the one next to me. I need them as much as I need you, Lord. Because you're in them just as much as you're in me. I want to be of one mind, one spirit, one purpose. I'm asking for grace that only flows through the body and my connection to it. Lord, show me how you want me to be connected. And show me what's breaking the connection so I can fix it. I want to be fixed because I want to be like you. I want to be your body in the earth, the fullness of you that fills all in all.